We are winding down our church year um, until we move into, and as we begin Advent as the, the new church year. Um, and so we're going to take a look at Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. It's one of the interesting things we need to remember that, you know, as, as we don't know exactly when Paul had his Damascus Road incident and, and his conversion there, but it was many years after that that he was learning what it meant to be a child of God, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, and 1 Thessalonians is the very first letter that Paul ever wrote. So in this letter, he's sort of trying to work out his, his own theology, his own understanding of what God is calling him to do. And it's, it's interesting the difference between how he grew up as a Pharisee and how he is now as a child of God. So listen for the word of God from Paul. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So wh whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are already doing. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, open our hearts, open our ears, open my mouth, that we may hear and proclaim your love for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a story about a young preacher who with great confidence came swaggering up to the pulpit one Sunday because he was going to preach his first sermon from memory. He didn't have a written script with him at all. He knew he was ready. And when, when he got into the pulpit, he looked out at the congregation and his mind went blank. Absolutely nothing. He couldn't think of a single thing he was supposed to stay. And his swagger quickly turned to embarrassment and beads of sweat broke out on his, on his forehead and the congregation is sort of looking at him like, okay, what in the world is going on? He was about to sit down when he remembered one short um, passage from the text he was using where Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. And so he stood there and thumped on the pulpit and said, Behold, I come quickly. And he was hoping by saying that first word that the sermon would just naturally flow <laughs> and, and nothing, absolutely nothing. And so he tried it a second time. Maybe this would work. And he thumped the pulpit a little harder and he spoke with more confidence. Behold, I come quickly. And the congregation is just staring at him like, okay, what's going on? By this time, this new young preacher was sort of panic-stricken, and he thought to himself, okay, I'm going to give it one more try, 
and if nothing works, I am never going to try to do this one again. So he took a step back, quickly stepped up to the pulpit, banged on it and said, behold, I come quickly. And it did. And the pulpit and the preacher and everything around him went falling into the congregation. And the pulpit went one way and the, and the young minister ended up in the lap of a wonderful little old lady, just you know, sort of the epitome of everybody's grandmother. And when he realized what had happened, he stood there, he looked at her and said, I'm sorry, I am so sorry. And she said, oh, don't worry about it, Sonny. It's all my fault. I should have moved. You told me three times you were going to come. <laughs> and just so you know, I, I have never tried to memorize a sermon. I, my mind doesn't work that way. I don't want to go blank. I also don't want to spend all of that time that it's going to take to memorize this thing. I could be doing so much more in that time. Besides, this is a good Lutheran church. And other than you, my dear, no one's going to break my fall if I were to fall into the congregation. Our passage from Paul uses a familiar phrase, but a very odd one if you think about it. God will come like a thief in the night. Now, God as a thief in the night, that is not the normal image I have of God. And when I think of a thief in the night, I want to be just about any other place than where I am if that thief is going to be there. So to fully understand and try to grasp what this day of the Lord is, what it meant to Paul and his followers, we need to go back into the Old Testament a little bit and, and, and read some of that and hear it. To the Jews in the first century, please understand that there were basically three ages or three time. Time was broken into three categories. One was the past, which you really didn't, worry about all that much. It's, you know, this is where we came from. There are things to re remember and honor, but the past is the past, and who cares? So they really had the present age, which they believed was completely and totally evil and corrupt, and then there was the age to come, which would be the time of God's glorious reign. The day of the Lord would be that terrifying moment, that frightening moment, when God would break through all the evil and corruption in the world in which we live and would usher in this new day of God. But it was a terrible, frightening day because they understood that the wrath, the anger of God would be unleashed on the entire world on the day of the Lord. Listen to how some of the Old Testament prophets talked about it from Isaiah. For the Lord God of hosts has a day of tumult, trampling and confusion in the valley of vision, a battering down of walls and a cry for help to the mountains. See, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. From Zephaniah, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warriors cry aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blasts and battle cries against the fortified cities, and against the lofty battlements. And the last one I'm going to read is from Joel. There are, go into your prophets, you can find this everywhere. Joel, excuse me, Joel said, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. With this understanding, it is no wonder that the people were absolutely frightened of the day of the Lord. 
main characteristics of the day of the Lord is one, it'll come suddenly and unexpectedly. Two, there would be upheaval on cosmic proportions where the universe would actually be shaken to its very foundations. And three, it would be a time and a day of judgment. As Paul grew up and grew to be a Pharisee, this was his understanding of what the day of the Lord was all about. And then Damascus hit. And several years later, he wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica, and he had discovered something entirely new because of his life with Jesus. As believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, Paul understood that we do not need to fear the day of the Lord. He said we are children of light. We are daughters and sons of the day. It's not that we strut around saying I am, a, I am on the good side and you are on the evil side. As children of God, as children of light, we are somehow different because God has made us different. We are holy because God makes us holy. And we begin to see things, we begin to see the world around us through the eyes of God. So when tragedies do occur, you mentioned September 11. When those tragedies do occur, we can face and confront that evil and at the same time claiming the promises of God. When unexpected health issues cause us to despair, we know it is not God's punishment for us. It is part of living. And God is holding us and comforting us through the struggles that lie ahead. When a loved one dies unexpectedly, we know as children of light that it is not because of some sin that they had committed and hadn't repented of. We know that God did not will them to die. We know that as children of light, we are limited human beings. We are subject to all sorts of things. And bad things do happen to very good people. When a loved one dies, we are assured that God is welcoming them home, giving them the, the, the room in the mansion that has been built for them. They are in a place of great joy with God, and God is holding us and loving us, wiping the tears from our eyes as we grieve, as children of light, as daughters and sons of the day. The obstacles that life throws at us are now witnessed and seen through the eyes of God's grace and through God's love. There are way too many authors that are writing things about the day of the Lord from an Old Testament or end time kind of scenario where there will be a great battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, where ultimately God will prevail and the good will, will, will win, but it will be at a great cost to us, and we must sharpen our swords to make sure that we are ready for the battle. Paul came to understand that as children of light, he said, we are already arrayed. We already have the weapons we need for the things that confront us. Paul said, since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We have all the things we need for any struggle that we go through. Faith, love, and hope. You see, we are engaged in a different kind of battle than we witness through our, through our daily news. Instead of, what, tanks, we have faith. Instead of bullets, we are provided with love. Instead of bombs and planes, we have hope. We face each new day with faith, love, and hope. And against these three things, nothing can stand. We face life 
and the struggles of living from an entirely new perspective. As Paul said, God destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord who died for us. This is where living begins with the assurance of salvation through Christ. It is God's desire that we obtain salvation, not God's wrath. The battles in life will be won not by weapons of mass destruction, not by bigger and better bombs and bullets, but we see on a too regular basis what happens when faith, love, and hope disappear. That's when children kill children in school, when faith, hope, and love disappear. That's when suicide bombers destroy themselves as well as anyone and anything near and around them, and they don't care who gets hurt. When faith, love, and hope disappear, people like Eric Freen think they can start a new revolution by ambushing policemen. If we are ever going to find a way out of the cycle of violence and revenge, we need to claim these promises of God. We need to live the gifts of faith, love, and hope that have already been given to us. Only then will the world begin to learn that there is a different way. I want to finish this by reading the passage from First Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Gene wrote, I don't need to deal with the question of when all of this is going to happen. You know as well as I that the day of the Master's coming can't be posted on our calendars. He won't call ahead and make an appointment any more than a burglar would. About the time everybody's walking around, complacent, congratulating each other, sure, we've made it, isn't it great, we can now take it easy, Everything is going to suddenly start falling apart. It's going to come as suddenly and inescapably as birth pangs to a pregnant woman. But friends, you're not in the dark. How could you be taken off guard by any of this? You are sons of light. You are daughters of the day. We live under the wide open skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like those others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Since we are creatures of the day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight sober, dressed up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. God didn't set us up for an angry rejection but for salvation from our Master, Jesus the Christ. He died for us, a death that triggered life. Whether we are awake with a, a living or asleep with the dead, we are alive with Him. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so that you'll all be together in this. No one left out, no one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep doing it. Friends, faith, love, and hope. Against these three things, nothing can stand. And these gifts have already been given to us to use and to share so that everyone we meet will see God's love shining through us. Thanks be to God.